I am good to people who are good. I'm also good to people who are not good. So the external factor of a person who whatever, let's say they're being not good, so to speak, that doesn't change us. We're good to everyone. If someone is bad, we don't become bad. So we have to protect this essence we have at all costs. And this is why people love the story of Christ so much because he was without sin. He was like the perfect example of what persons should be, a nice and loving person. At the time, loving our enemies was such an extreme idea. But we humans, even today, have still yet to put it into practice. But it's very important that we do this, that we are good no matter what. Because why? We have that decision as humans. We have a choice. Hello and welcome back to this series on the Tao Te Ching where we're going over each individual chapter of Taoism's most important text. So like always, if you're new here, I recommend going to my channel where I have all the videos in a playlist, up to date, and in order for you to watch. So without further delay, reading from the Jia Fu Feng and Jane English translation of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, here is chapter 49. The wise do not hold opinions. They are aware of the needs of others. I am good to people who are good. I am also good to people who are not good, because virtue is goodness. I have faith in people who are faithful. I also have faith in people who are not faithful, because virtue is faithfulness. The wise are shy and humble. They behave like small children. To the world, they seem confusing, yet people look to them and listen. So we have quite an interesting chapter here. So in the first part, the wise do not hold opinions. They are aware of the needs of others. So to be very clear from the get-go, I just want to say this very clearly. Opinions, human opinions, are the fruits of the ego. I'll say that again. Opinions are the fruits of the ego. Quite frankly, opinions, they're not even real. And they cause most of the world's problems, most of the world's suffering. So this chapter, so this ver very first part is very blunt. Wise don't hold opinions. The wise followers of the Tao, people who are spiritual and religious and try to keep the virtue that they devote their lives around, they don't have any opinions. Why is that? Well, there's other things that need to get done. You ever had people who they want to get your opinion on something, like something about celebrities or politicians or something like that. And you're just kind of like, I got stuff to do, man. Like, that's that's literally what this is. And you can look at the world today, quite frankly, throughout history. And what have humans been doing uh, very, very often throughout our history? What is the human default? Is it creating a better environment, better immediate environment, helping people around us? Not really. You know, it's been killing each other tearing each other down, a lot of division, conflict, tribalism. And so the reason I bring this up is because what is the root of all these things? You know, a lot of people say that it's money. A lot of people say that it's greed. Yes, these are factors, yes. But if you really, really get to down to brass tacks, so to speak, they all come from opinions. People have their silly little opinions, and it could be anything from I don't like that person's body language. I don't like the way that person walked by me. And now you have some weird conflict between two people based on assumptions, not based on truth at all. And then it could be anything to, I don't like the way they look. They look different. They're dirty. We're better. We're superior. Whatever it is, next thing you know, you have millions of people dying. And so you think, what are the seeds of all these problems? Well, they're pretty much their opinions. There are silly, silly little opinions. Opinions are the seeds of destruction, of human conflict. Now, I want to make something clear because somebody could be watching this and think, um, you know, misinterpreting it in a very bad way and think that I'm some kind of person who is anti-expression or, 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 you know, I'm saying that we should not have any kind of expression or share our perspectives or have any kind of exposure. Quite the contrary. I'm not talking about sharing perspectives and having a healthy discussion. Not at all. I want that to be very clear. You know, I know a lot of this stuff about free speech is a hot, hot button topic today, but that's not what I'm talking about here when I say opinions. Opinions, you know, in this context, I would say more so are viewpoints that we believe are factual and more importantly, we impose on the rest of the world. 
You could say, for example, the British had the opinion that they were superior to the people in India. So they literally acted as such. Hundreds of millions of people died, and it all came from this kind of opinion that the white race is, is uh, you know, superior. That's what I'm talking about in terms of an opinion. Or that everybody should be in this kind of economic pursuit and situation, or that these people should be following this line of my religion over that. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not saying, well, I want to tell you a little bit about my culture. I want, I'm not talking about that. That's a good thing. We should be sharing perspectives. In fact, everything on this channel, hopefully, is me sharing my perspective and not my opinion. But I just want to make it clear. I'm talking about opinions in terms of what are the seeds of destruction and disagreement that we have. And so we have to take all of this with a grain of salt listen to this with our philosophical ears, read this stuff with our philosophical uh, lenses, so to speak. So now that I got that out of the way, all these opinions, whether it's the Mong Mongol Empire, you know, the, the opinions they made a ha might have had, that they were going to use their power to take over so much of Asia, the opinions of the Germans in the 1940s, the opinions that led to the man-made famines throughout history, these all were opinions, okay? And this is the thing that this, and philosophically speaking, the language here is important. It's like, there's the wise, they don't have any opinions, good leaders, good people who are spiritual, they're, they're wise, they're followers of the Tao, they're followers of Christ, whatever it might be, they don't have any opinions why things need to get done. And I know that I am simplifying a lot here, okay? But bear with me, we're all part of the human family, like I used, li I like to use the example often of the tree of life, right? That pretty much we are all kind of tips of the branch on this one big tree of life. And fighting each other is as silly as branches on the same tree trying to hurt each other, trying to knock each other down because they're so out there. They think these are different branches, yet meanwhile, they're attached to the same tree. That's how ridiculous it is for us to be fighting and killing each other especially over these opinions. And so, as it is put very bluntly, the wise followers of God have no opinion. Why? Because there's things that need to get done. The wise are aware of the needs of others. And in this next part here, I am good to people who are good. I am also good to people who are not good because virtue is goodness. I have faith in people who are faithful. I also have faith in people who are not faithful because virtue is faithfulness. And so here we are reminded that the wise ultimately are indifferent. Indifferent, And this goes hand in hand with what was just said, that the wise don't have opinions. Why? Because people have needs. People have basic needs that aren't getting met. There's, I believe, uh, more than well over a billion people who go to bed hungry. There are no good and bad people. There are only people. And yes, there are indecent and decent qualities that we can address humanity in. Like Viktor Frankl said when he was asked about his potential resentment towards the German people for what they did uh, in the death camps, he said there are only two kinds of people, the decent and the indecent. And so there are things that we have that we can consider pleasant. We need to remember that Taoism is amoral. It is non-dualistic. There is no ultimate standard in Taoist philosophy in terms of what is good or what is bad. But we also do keep in mind what humans naturally consider pleasant and unpleasant. And that's not something that is written in a Taoist text or anything in the Tao Te Ching or the Zhuangzi or anything like that. But it's something that we naturally know. It is natural. What you can consider naturally pleasant. Smiling, being curious, you know, talking. These can be considered naturally pleasant. A lot of times you can see this stuff in kids, right? The way kids interact very naturally with each other. Hating, violent acts, screaming at people. These can be examples of things that are naturally unpleasant. And so there are these things that are naturally pleasant and unpleasant, but ultimately there is no set being. You know, you'll notice in a lot of religions and philosophies that there is kind of an answer for everything. And it's fine, you know, there, I'm not, you know, against that completely. It's fine as they are, but I'm just explaining it in this context here with Taoism and amorality and non-dualism. There is no set standard. There is no set standard to be imposed on every little thing. Is this good? Is this bad? And so the followers of the Tao see humans as humans. 
And I love this because it's very reflective of the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated. I'm also good to people who are not good. I also have faith in people who are not faithful. So there is also an, another element here that is really beautiful of non-judgment, that it is not well. I'm not good because I've addressed this person through my opinion as not good or not faithful. No, that's not there. There's no room for that. People are people. And this is much easier said than done, right? The world is a very complex place, but ultimately I'd like to believe that a lot of us, hopefully everybody watching this is up to the challenge of seeing people as people regardless. Because there is another factor here that is also really beautiful. I am good to people who are good. I'm also good to people who are not good. So the external factor of a person who, whatever, let's say they're being not good, so to speak, that doesn't change us, okay? We're good to everyone. If someone is bad, we don't become bad. You know, we don't reciprocate the badness to them. So we have to protect this essence we have at all costs. And this is why people love the story of Christ so much because he was without sin. He was like the perfect example of what a person person should be, a nice, nice, kind, respectful, and loving person. At the time, loving our enemies was such an extreme idea, but we humans, even today, have still yet to put it into practice. That's part of our unpleasant side. But it's very important that we do this, that we are good no matter what, because why? We have that decision as humans. We have a choice because without it, we really become animals acting on instinct with pretty big brains and, you know, more complex intellects. And we don't want that. We don't want to be smart animals, okay? We want to be like humans who choose to do the right thing. Like I said, natural pleasantness. And with that, we have faith and we do not cast judgment. Judgments are for God, right? Human judgments, human opinions, right? Those are the fruits of the ego. And like it is said in the beginning of the chapter, the wise do not hold opinions. So in the next part here, the wise are shy and humble. They behave like small children. To the world they seem confusing, yet people look to them and listen. So you have the followers of the Tao, like all kinds of spiritual people throughout this earth, saints, mystics, rabbis, imams, priests. There is an element to them that is like a newborn baby. You'd have heard, you've heard me talk on this in this series before about the idea of reverting, right? Becoming like how we were before, which is very prevalent in Islam. You know, everyone is born in submission to God and in being a Muslim, you are returning back to that. Similar in Christianity and how you are being born again, consciously making the decision to be reborn as a follower of Christ. Gurus as well. This idea of completely renouncing the world and bodily pleasures in order to be more in line with the divine. And there is an element to all these that they become again like a child. But of course, they're not like a child, like Gugu Gaga, you know, with a rattle. But they are in a state of pure, natural essence, that, that which we're all born with. But they have channeled it through this kind of renunciation. And ironically... These people are often pretty misunderstood. They're pretty judged. They're pretty like, uh, you know, they, they're not doing anything. They're lazy. What are those mystics doing? Yet at the same time, people really do come to them and are like, hey, <laughs> you know, they want the answers. And, you know, this is really something because you really think about how it's written in this chapter that the wise, they're shy, they're humble. They behave like small children. They're kind of going against what is considered good and successful and what is considered admirable, you know, material wealth and, and royalty and things like that of this world, they are confusing to most of the world, yet people look to them and they listen. And, and I think that is really something and that's really beautiful. And that is something that happens within us when we start to read the Tao Te Ching, we start to meditate on all of these chapters quite frequently. And then suddenly, like I said, there's this topsy-turvy thing where suddenly we become pretty unable to see things in the same way. And that we get a small fragment of what a lot of these mystics and sages have. We become, again, like a newborn babe. We become like a child. But of course, like I said, not in like a laying down in a cradle baby kind of way. But like I mentioned in the last chapter, we've removed the clutter and our natural essence is able to flourish. We have returned to that state of pure submission to God, but this time by choice. We begin to flow like water, you could say. And babies and children, they will always be like 
one of the greatest teachers to us. You know, people are amazed by kids and babies, not just because they're full of potential and, you know, people are excited. They say, oh, look, come see the baby, like things like that. I really do believe that we are looking at God in a certain way. We really are like, this is the closest thing we have. Like I said, in nature, the closest thing we have to God and the Tao in this kind of non-dualistic example is water. Well, I really do believe in a human context. The closest thing we have to a human being in pure submission to God is a baby. And it's not really by choice, right? Because they're literally helpless and they are nothing but potential. And there is this element, you know, because a lot of people will joke and say, well, when a baby grows up, they, they don't care anymore. And so when you have a baby, it is kind of like, look, it's, it's still perfect. It's still in this pure state of submission. Come look, it's so great. And then 10 years later, you're like, okay, you know, you're, you know, go to school. You're a teenager now. Come on, go get, go get domesticated. But babies are this true, like pure, pure submission, this pure example of God. And we should be able to see God in everything. But there is something very special about the, the innocence of a baby. And so the wise kind of become like that willingly as adults so that we can channel that original nature, that original essence we have.